all the people they saw were of great size, uh, and we look like grasshoppers to ourselves, and so <laughs> we must have looked to them. But also, one of the things when they had sal- sent scouts ahead when they were out in the desert, um, 12 tribes, uh, the country that we traversed and scouted is one that devours its settlers. <laughs> so, you know, even in the... Um, The Torah, or I don't know if that's even mentioned in the Old Testament, I was lucky enough to speak with a um, savant who was able to tell me, and so point blank, that the the, um, record number of um, things that were repeated in the Bible, blood, was 447 times, chosen was 123, and the word seed was 280. It's just interesting that there's so many little clues, and and I'm wondering whether the Nephilim would be coming in on the Nibiru uh, or the All right, Melanin. that's a, certainly a fair question. We'll take that. Um, Jason? Well, I appreciate the call, and wow, I, I'm not sure if that's the Margie I know, but I, I do know someone named Margie in California closely, and uh, that was a very interesting piece of information. Is um, Marjorie, Marjorie, you know, normally negative? No. <laughs> this one is. Okay. Well, <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Um, uh, you know, the Nephilim coming in on Nibiru, uh, you know, mm-hmm. so the word Nephilim, the fallen ones, um, again, we're starting to talk about more recent descriptions, which I think, here's how I would answer it. We see an overriding theme that comes out of the Sumerian Anunnaki, the number 12. Um they came, Nibiru is the 12th planet, Anunnaki coming from the 12th planet in our solar system. Well, mm-hmm. if we think about there's the 12 Greek Olympians, the 12 tribes of Jesus, the 12, deci- uh, excuse me, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples of Jesus, 12 hours in a day, 12 months in a, in a year, 12 inches in a foot, all of these references to 12 actually stem from Sumer originally saying that their gods came from the 12th planet and created, again, based on astronomical movements, all of the things that we use today around time and measurement. So her question was, are they going to be coming with the planet? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. All I can say is, is that all the references we have for the idea of, you know, 12 gods in this system um, it, it's it's very possible that Nibiru, again, was kind of the core story of all of these references to 12 in our biblical tales of the 12 disciples of Jesus or the 12 tribes mm. of Israel, uh, 12 Greek, Greek Olympians. So, yes, there could be some correlation to the idea that, that the word Nephilim is referring to, again, these ancient gods, the Anunnaki. All right. Uh, Mark in Pennsylvania. Hello. Mark? Yes, sir. Sidonian Roswells. <laughs> Thank you. Jason? Yes. This is your old friend, Mark the Webmaster. Yes. Hey, Mark, the, 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 the face on Mars, the second face on Mars, the, the man who brought that to life. That's correct. As well as, you might recall, the two dolphins, which get very little coverage, but yes. if you Google that, the two dolphins at Sidonia, you will find it just like there are two faces, there are two dolphins. These are not a case of pareidolia or any other made-up term that uh, Michael Shermer's Skeptical Society might want to come up with. They are right. real, and they're part of something that, again, still needs to be brought out further, like you said. Now, I wanted to, to bring up, you guys have gotten a little bit into the DNA and the genetics earlier, but left a kind of light on that. I really wanted to direct people um, and ask them to research chromosome 2. Now, you know, what this is, uh, as you know, uh, all the other major primates all have 48 chromosomes, um, and the humans have, t- have 40, uh, 46. In other words, we went from 24 pairs to 23, and yet somehow lost a chromosome. You know, lost a chromosome. Gosh, how does that happen? Well, what's been discovered, um, fitting right on, as you know, I am a Sitchinite, um, you know, yeah. and I... And I take his work to heart and consider him to be a genius on the level of Einstein. And later on, hopefully, he'll be recognized as such. All of his his work from the past leading up to now, from rogue planets that the Sumerians talked about before anybody in any sense of anything like that, now we know that there are billions of them flying or whizzing around this, uh, each galaxy. So leading up from that oldest information to now, the chromosome 2 situation is the following. Um, s- somehow even though there's never been another mammalian fusion of two 
uh, two chromosomes where it was based at the telomeres. Somehow, someone flipped over the third primate chromosome, fused it to the second primate chromosome, and that's why humans only have 23, not 24. And at the same time, a huge amount of DNA and genetic information seems to have appeared together at that same time. Scientists will say, oh, well, maybe when that fusion happened, some sort of the DNA from some bug got in there somehow. Okay. All of this fits specifically and precisely in with the work of Zechariah Sitchin and the creation of humans by jumpstarting evolution, taking that Homo erectus, something along those lines, and flipping over, fusing uh, the genes together and inserting their own. There is still a little bit of an open question of what was that required for. We can't be absolutely Chromosome certain, two. Chromosome two, and if everybody just dives into that further, I think all of our answers ultimately. I one time was riding on the subway through uh, Bethesda, Maryland, and I happened to see a gaggle of about 20 of these guys working from the, uh, from the NIH and the genetics department, and I questioned them about this, and they went stone-faced when I confronted them with it. So, again, there's a lot of questions still out there, but I think all of Stitchin's work will ultimately be recognized as correct, you know, on the, the large, uh, you know, the, the overall value of it. And chromosome 2, I think, is where we're all going to be able to find out exactly what went on when humans were created. And, again, this goes back to the lady earlier that was talking about uh, the Torah and what have you, the Sumerian creation tablets are a much more detailed version of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Torah, the first scroll. Right. Um, you can see, a, a, like you referenced before, MJ-12. I actually don't take that as a joke. I actually personally think that that was sort of a, a little bit of a tongue <laughs> a little bit of a tongue Who knows? When, you know, yeah. When they, when they set up the control group for the UFO phenomenon, I think they very well, definitely by then, um, you know, had that sort of uh, access to some of the... the the old information that the the twelfth, uh, you know, the twelve, uh, the Anunnaki passed between Mars and Jupiter every thirty mm-hmm. six hundred years. And again, for the uh, for the people that were wondering how how does that work, you know, when you have a thirty six hundred year orbit that takes it ten times out further than Pluto, um, and before it comes back from below the uh, below the ecliptic and then comes back from beneath and passes through the asteroid belt, clearing out the space like you mentioned, um, you know, when that planet is out there, it's not receiving really any energy from the sun. So it's likely that Nibiru is an internally heated planet, uh, that the gold that they sought after to create the monoatomic golden sphere around their home planet was something that they could only achieve from another, you know, an Earth-like planet where they could go and mine for the gold, uh, which is why it specifically said they came here. And that's why they then ultimately, after there was the mutiny and in Harsag and her half-brothers Enlil uh, and Enki, you know, dealing with this mutiny, um, decide to jumpstart evolution, and that's why they created the easily hypnotizable, gold lusting after slave worker that we appear to have been, and ultimately both a worker slash worshiper, which is why we brought uh, the burnt offerings of, of the Hebrew Bible. That's just bringing cooked food to the Anunnaki beings. Um, which, by the way, uh, all right, the mon- caller, we're, we're kind of short on time, so. I'll just leave it at, at, I'll leave it at the question of Jason. Uh, you know, I hope you'll look further in the chromosome too, and if you can explore that further. Um, I think that's got a lot of the answers that you might be searching for, and I hope you'll address that either tonight or in future shows. Thanks okay. for your enthusiasm, uh, Mark. Probably have to be future shows, I would imagine. That's something you've got to look into. Very interesting, though. Very, very interesting. Um, obviously, a lot of people put a lot of stock in this. Uh, Ohio brings Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Uh, Hello. Let's see. Did I? No, I didn't. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Jeff. Uh, yes, sir. It's a pleasure talking to you. All right. You're not really easy. You don't have a very good connection, so go ahead. Uh, well, I just got one question. You know, we're always exploring, you know, like the moon going uh, up. And we all just, I don't know the answer to this. Maybe I know. Do we ever explore behind us? I'm sorry. Again, please? Do we explore behind us, behind the earth? You know, like we're standing on the moon looking at the earth. The space behind us. Will we explore that? Uh, well, I, I think I understand what he's saying. Uh, the the best answer I could probably give for the caller there is, um, you know, as an example, let's say the dark side of the moon. Um, there there are areas within our solar system that are not completely visible to us, even with our telescopes. And so, if I understood the caller, hopefully, you know, as an answer, I would say. Places like the dark side of the moon actually contain a whole slew of 
theories that come out that there's actually a civilization currently on the moon, on the dark side, that when we landed there, we were told, hey, you know, <laughs> you're not really, we don't really want you here. Uh, and, and, and even some of our astronauts is being quoted, why do you send us here in tricycles when the military is here in a Ferrari? Actually, so, yes, I, I heard that very recently, that uh, we were warned off the moon. Yeah, so, I mean, who knows? And that's obviously a whole show in itself, uh, exploring that topic, but uh, I do find it fascinating. So do I. Uh, David, uh, you're on the air on Skype. Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It sounds really good. Well, as well as to you, Area 51s. Good to hear your voice. Uh, I really believe that we are an expanding Earth, and I know that the fellow who came up with that proposition died, but his proposition was not not only was the Earth expanding, but the whole universe is expanding, mm -hmm. our solar system is, and the time frame between cycles, between the visit of Nibiru, I believe is actually shortening. And I don't believe that we have 9,000 years. We're closer. Why do you think it's shortening? Because of the expansion? Um, well, you had that notion yourself with the quickening. We seem to see that we're advancing towards another ice age pretty quick. And, and we just got out of the last one. And that hadn't happened before, so I'm just suspecting. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but, one thing. Oh, sir, please continue. No, actually, I'd like to have your opinion on Okay, so, so okay. one quick clarification I would like to make is that Nibiru's coming back does not coincide with our ascension into the Golden Age, which will take place around 9,000 years from now. Uh, Nibiru returning is probably going to happen around, I think it's 2190 or something like that. It's not very far away as far as Sitchin's calculations. And forgive me if I'm wrong on that exact number, but it's actually not that far off, maybe you know, a few hundred years. Uh, but, you know, what's going to happen when this planet passes by us next, I, you know, that would be hard to uh, speculate on. Okay. Uh, Louisiana and John. Hi, John. Hi. Hi, Art. Hello? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, recent listener, uh, first time caller, really enjoy your show. Thank you. And uh, J Jason, I really enjoy your show and the History Channel also. Sweet, uh, thank But you. anyway, uh, my question uh, is: uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, the global power grid that uh, the pyramids could be part of, uh, and uh, the the Mayan, uh, uh, Incan, uh, Egyptian pyramids may have been part of. Now, has anyone ever? Uh, Drawn lines between this, all these locations to see if any kind of pattern emerges. And uh, could there be other places that haven't been found yet? Uh, let's say, for example, like uh, uh, could the Bermuda Triangle be kind of a focal point for that power grid? Okay. Well, it's a great question. Uh, answer it like this um, The geodetic site like Stonehenge and Giza. Giza is, is, is actually on the exact center point of our landmass. And so many of these other sites, again, are at specific geodetic locations where it is possible that there was some type of an energy or something that they were utilizing, a world energy grid, you know, to tap into this uh, type of power. He asked about lines, whether... Um... Right. Uh, the other thing to at least say there is that there is a term called ley lines, and it seems mm -hmm. that yes, many of these megalithic sites do fall on these ley lines, these um, energy, you know, signatures uh, that again, we don't really understand how this functions or if there's enough energy now even to detect it, but it, the theory is that at some point in our past these were all charged sites that somehow transferred energy between them. Boy, it really sounds like a lot of what you're saying is is falling in line with some of what Richard Hoagland talks about when he talks about um, his, um, well, when he talks about everything, actually, a lot of what you're saying. 3.14, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it does. Uh, let's see. Texas uh, brings John. Hi, John. Hello. Hello, Art. Um, 
The Sirius is really cool. I'll, I just stopped the broadcast so I can listen to myself later. Um, my uh, speaking of chromosomes, um, are we? My question is, are we still slaves? I mean, I guess the Anunnaki came here and enslaved us, or one of the brothers apparently enslaved Nothing us. Nothing but a bunch of gold diggers. Right. <laughs> and so I saw with a friend a UFO when I was young, and that and that wasn't a problem. And then uh, when I got a little bit older, both of my sisters, uh, on separate occasions, showed me UFOs. One uh, out of my older sister's bedroom window at night behind the curtains. They were flying around the house, and I said, what are they here for? Or what are they doing? She said, well, they're here to protect us. The next one was my younger sister out of my bedroom window at night. And, and this, I don't relates, know, this part, relates, how, how does this relate to Jason's? Well, uh, okay, it has, re, it has to do with slavery. Okay, speaking uh-huh. of chromosomes, because nothing happened to me. And how did my sisters know to point out these these UFOs? Well, I actually love the caller's <clears throat> comment and, and, and question, and I'd answer it this way. There's an excellent 12-hour miniseries by Steven Spielberg called Taken, and it shows the involvement, and even Art's obviously a playoff in there, with driving around in his trailer with the genetic little, little girl, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But Taken is an excellent series that shows these lineages, you know, the lineage track uh, through an abduction channel. And who knows? But, I mean, I think something like Taken is an excellent documentary that sheds light into that type of a question because well yeah, some, I mean, some, to be fair it wasn't a documentary okay. it was actually fiction right you're right right i shouldn't use i i <laughs> use the word documentary loosely because they used tangible references like you oh well, they did okay uh and a trilateral symbol on the clothing of some of the people and uh whack and hut security Maybe the point is is you know certain things in our media and, and you know I think taken to answer your question is an interesting topic into why I might be lying in bed and I would get abducted, but not my fiance. Not that I get abducted, <laughs> but my point is, is that sometimes it's very genetically selective, um, even outside of our family unit. They might want the, the child rather than the mother. I don't know why, but it is a very interesting question. Okay. Uh, Montana brings Bud. Hi, Bud. Howdy. How you doing Hi. tonight? Fine. Well, uh, I was just kind of wondering because, you know, I'm a big fan of art, and I'm a big fan of Jason, and I'm a big fan of the of the program Ancient Aliens. And Thank you. But uh, I'm, I'm big, you know, Jason talked a little earlier about how different uh, solar systems and the universes actually get closer to each other, and that gives us a... a uh, an ability to fly from one to the other mm-hmm. as aliens go and I was wondering because I'm in this like I was in Alaska when Hale Bop went by and uh, it was beautiful up there I mean I wow did you guys see this did you read Discover Magazine this month with this new comet that's coming in that they discovered like about I saw him you mean Don't there's, you know com- there's another comet coming in are you referring to ISON? And they, and they, said, it, and they said it left the, the port cloud. You know? Sir? Yeah. Can I'm you hear me? Now, wait. Hello, yeah. hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello. hello. Are, you yeah, talking about, you. are you talking about ISON? Yep. Okay. And it's going to be here next fall. Now, these comets have a gravitational effect on Earth is when they come by. You're right. So, they also have a static charge that affects our planet's Electromagnetics. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really great point, sir. Uh, you know, these, these things, you know, have been cited many times where I'm not scared. I don't think anything's going to happen. But I do think it's interesting that now we're starting to pay attention. And Cause they're to the comments. Like the yeah. They're like, they're like, they're like the, 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 uh, did I lose you? No, no, no please continue. They're, okay. they're like... They're like that that device that they found in the in the sea out there that that was so precise, and our universe and our solar system is just like that. I mean, it's a big clock that just works like that. You know, yeah. I've always thought that. I've always thought that. And you and you and 
when you're on your show, Ancient Aliens and everything, and you're explaining this, I love it. You know, and I just wanted to, you know, just your thoughts on these comets coming in. I don't think anything's going to happen either as, as far as this comet, because they've already got it projected, and they ain't even going to be here till next fall. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, ISON will be the closest approach to the sun, I believe, in November. I think that's correct. Um, at the end of November is, is what I've heard. Now, I know that comets have a pretty significant impact on the sun, and a lot of people believe that comets have a very significant uh, relationship to our sun, and frequently when there's a comet around, you see an awful lot of activity on the sun, and I would like to point out that right now we have lots of activity on the sun. Any any comments, Jason? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I think it's very interesting that comets in ancient times were always a precursor to some event or That's a right. change. And, you know, there's also the idea that any large body moving through our solar system, whether it be a planet X or, or anything, uh, those gravitational forces are at effect so that there could be debris following any large object so mm-hmm. that, you know, if we were to start seeing a inflection of a lot of comets, maybe that's a precursor to something else, you know, headed this way. <laughs> okay, hold it right there. Um... Our number is 855-REAL-UFO. Our guest is Jason Martell, and we're talking about ancient astronauts. I'm Art Bell, and it's Dark Matter. Remember, we've got Skype available for you. So if you want to call us on Skype from anywhere, actually, we'll just open it for all. But I'd love to hear from you out of the country. If you're actually out of the country... Be a blast to have you get through, uh, or within the country, I guess, too. Uh, the way to dial is art.bell51. That's my Skype name, art.bell51. Jason Martell is my guest, and back to the lines we go. Let's go here, California, and Mike, hi. Hello, Art Bell. It's uh, been a long time since I've heard you. Last time I was listening to you, you were on FM. You could probably tell me how many years ago that was, but I just recently got a vehicle with satellite radio and rediscovered you and been listening tonight. And, Jason, I've got a big question for you in regards to biblical prophecy. Okay. The, the accuracy of past biblical prophecy leading up to today and the way the world is today and Revelation and its future biblical prophecy seems to me like somebody would have had to have an ability to travel through time to be as accurate as the Bible is and has been. Uh, my, I'm a born-again Christian, and I definitely believe that God created everything, the heavens and the earth, and that He is outside of time. And there you go, Jason. Caused, he caused this Bible to be written for us, basic instruction before leaving earth. And I just wondered what your take on the future biblical prophecy about Jesus' return and the way that the world is going today. It, it, to me, it seems like it's very, very accurately predicted in the Bible. Yeah. And I'll let, you, I'll let you answer that, and I'll listen on the air. Thank you. I yeah. think that Jason's... I'm, I'm going to say something. I think that Jason's take on things doesn't um, uh, is not in opposition to the Bible, but rather he thinks that the Bible documents along with what he believes to be the way things happen. Right, Jason? Thank you, Art. Yes, I very much so, from the beginning of my interest, are, am trying to up, uphold the biblical veracity. Mm-hmm. Uh, very much so. Um, and, and that's where it started to get very interesting to me when I you know, find out about these things like the Anunnaki and the Sumerians. Um, so, you know, as far as the, the Bible being accurate and things coming in the future, I, too, as a young Christian, found things very interesting when I started to get a, a foothold into the field of ufology and just kind of tangentially noticed that things happening in the Middle East uh, are escalating and have been. And um, I don't really know what any of that means from the biblical angle because, you know, I, we're, we're in a state of uh, exponentially, you know, speeding up, you're quickening. But I don't think that's, a, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, so the biblical prophecy of the future is very hard to predict. But what I, what I do is give analogies that hopefully shed light into, you know, <laughs> reality. Let's just say all of a sudden, 
over Wilshire Boulevard and, and Beverly Hills, these clouds emerge and this bright light spewing out of the clouds. And all of a sudden, Jesus, a figure that looks like Jesus in white robes, is descending into the middle of the street. What would happen, right? People would freak out. And, and then our sciences would take over. We'd want to test the atmosphere around Jesus, the, 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 the gas that he's ascending on. How's it holding him up? His <laughs> cloth true. material, what is it made of? Right? We would we would take that approach. We would want Absolutely. to use our sciences to go, uh, I'm blinking twice, what's going on? Right. Nothing like that ever publicly happens or has in our lifetime. Now, all the ancients recorded these amazing events like that, so it's a very hard question to answer what's going to happen in the future. And the mention of time travel is the last piece I'd like to comment on. Philip Corso Jr., his book, and the understanding that we've been taking the Roswell craft back in time over and over, mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. it easier for us to reverse engineer. It's a whole other topic that we couldn't even cover tonight, but I'm a firm believer in the idea that we must be using some type of time travel. There's never been an alien invasion. There's never been a nuclear weapon detonated. And I don't think there will be if we had the ability to foresee these events and then change the parameters so that they don't come to light. Okay. So you think time travel is a reality and in use constantly? I unfortunately do, but I don't okay. fully That's comprehend right. it. Yeah. <laughs> on Skype, uh, Jim, you're on the air. Oh, hi, Art. Hi. Uh, there's a little bit of delay, so my timing's a little bit off. Uh, well, just turn your radio off and uh, not to worry. You got it. Yeah. I have been noticing uh, many discussions over the last 20 years about Sitchins <clears throat> and the Anunnaki. And one of the things that really intrigues me is the possibility. There's a quotation. The, Anu, the, Ananu, the Anuna, the gods, whom An conceived in the sky. And, you know, I've always conceived of a visiting civilization, you know, uh, inhabiting a planet or a really huge, you know, orbiting object of some sort. And I wonder how much and how much thought the gentlemen of, have uh, put into that concept of visiting gods on a, a planetary object. Quite a bit, apparently. Jason? Right. Well, if I understood the question, uh, you know, the idea that we've had gods visiting us and they're coming from, you know, a, a spaceship slash planet. Um, Nibiru is, has been in question for ever since the idea that there is a Nibiru, <laughs> a planet that we potentially have ancient gods that live on. Is Nibiru a spaceship? Is it a planet? Um, all the evidence points to the fact that it's a, a an actual planet based on the descriptions by the Anunnaki given directly to a human being and, and written down. The Nibiru is a very mountainous planet. It has very high mountain peaks and very low oceans. How do we and know this? Because, well, we don't. We only have the descriptions of what the Anunnaki told a Sumerian scribe with a priest present and they wrote it down as sacred information. Okay. So Nibiru is a mountainous planet, low water level, and has a certain type of a glow to it. And the Anunnaki themselves are said to have had a glow. That's why we see a halo around these angels and beings from the heavens, is because they literally glowed to a certain degree. It's kind of like you are what you eat, and coming from a glowing planet, they maintain that uh, phosphorescence naturally. All right, uh, let's go to North Carolina. And Benjamin, you're on the air with Jason Martell. Hi, um, I just had a question about the... The Egyptian pyramid. I've, okay. I've heard you. I've heard you talk about the pyramid on a couple of different shows, and then and then also today. Is it possible that the Egyptians had such a large, strong army that this army built those pyramids for their pharaoh? Or is, <laughs> you, is it, well, that that certainly uh, would be the story if you ask an Egyptian. Um, antiquities person, they would absolutely tell you that, yes, that is how it occurred. You know, a lot of slave labor, the army, yes, like that. But uh, if you talk to engineers and you talk to scientists, they will talk about the impossibility of... And, and frankly, in modern times, they've tried to duplicate the 
pyramids with no luck at all. They'd have to move like a stone every two minutes or something, 24 hours a day, not even counting the 7,000 tons of several, you know, trilithoton blocks that are, are put into place. All right. Does that help you? Uh, I mean, I guess. I, I, I've been kind of curious to know how the Egyptian pyramids are put there also. <laughs> yeah, so are we. Um, thank you very much. Your best guess, Jason, about how the pyramids got there? Uh, my best guess is that there is a lost, there was a lost culture here that could have been human or a hybrid. It's a reference to those beings I mentioned earlier that we see at Bada Valley in Indonesia or the Moai heads in Rapa Nui or the beings depicted at Gobekli Tepe. Right. These slender beings with the arms folded at the waist. It seems to be that there is a lost race or civilization that they were the ones that were doing all the vitrification of stone and building all these monuments accurately and perfectly. And then all the cultures that we now know of have retained that information as best they could. All right, to Canada, way up north, and Doug. Hi, Doug. Hello, Doug. Hey, how you doing tonight? Okay. Um, hey, Art. Hey, James. How you doing? Um, the question I had was, how come all, well, most of them, I'm not sure, but Caucasians all have two chromosomes less than the aboriginals over in Australia? Boy, I, I unfortunately have to... Uh bow out on that question and would we just be giving you you know information that I couldn't exactly relate to that exact question so okay because that was my question I just want to know because um, I was reading on the internet that the aboriginals have two more chromosomes than the Caucasians gee I wasn't but, aware of that that's that's worth pursuing in terms of just knowledge I'd like to know myself yeah, yeah. I, I, thank you and, and I, I know a caller earlier my, my friend Mark who you know brought up chromosome 2 I don't know if that ties into that at all, but, uh, you know, again, our our genetics, I think, uh, the deeper we look in there, the further out we might realize we actually come from. You mentioned something earlier I've been curious about for a very long time, uh, Jason, and that is junk, so-called junk DNA. Right. Um, I doubt that it's junk. I mean, whether it was God that laid it all out or an alien or whoever... We could be offending somebody by calling it junk. <laughs> yeah, referring to it as junk DNA, probably, I guess I don't buy that. It, it has, it means something. Yeah, it's kind of like your tonsils. It does something. We just don't know what it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, to North Carolina again and Les. Hi. Hey, Art. Uh, many Roswell, Roswells to you. Um, Jason, uh, according to your uh, the best math, the best math available. Um, where would Planet X be coming from? And I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you, guys. For oh, good that's a time. really, really, really good question. Uh, if you were going to look in a direction, uh, Jason, uh, and you were directing a telescope to keep an eye out, where would you tell them to look? The southern skies. Um, th- there's a. That's actually a great question because it yes. ties into what what you know, I kind of wanted to touch on earlier, but. Hopefully for a future show, we'll dive really deep into the whole idea of a planet X and its current orbit. Because, you know, everyone up to this point is plotting planet X on an orbit that's just around our one sun. So if we think about the fact that we're binary, planet X is probably, if it does exist, it's orbiting two suns. That's why it can go way out there and loop back around. There might be another gravitational field because of our second sun that causes causes it to swing back this way. Okay, um, just a basic question, Jason. Why can't we see the second sun? We can't see the second sun because we don't know where it is. Well, but a sun, by its nature, even if it's a you know red dwarf or not particularly bright, is bright compared to other objects, right? It is. Uh, it is, Art. It is. But when we flip on the telescope, there's like 2,000 suns and rogue planets floating around, and we don't know all of their trajectories. We choose and pick ones that are interesting to the scientific community and track it, but there's very large possibilities that we've already taken astronomical plates of the southern sky, and Planet X is in there, but we just don't know which one it is. Hmm. All right, uh, let's go to California and Danny. Hi, Danny. Hi, Art. Uh, How are you? Fine. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, talk about maybe some of the other artifacts found that might support some of the uh, um, strange buildings in Egypt, and you know, just 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 talk about a little bit more uh, of some of the, the things that were found. Okay. Well. Uh, I'd like to make a comment then about Egypt, which is very interesting for our view of the past. Uh, there is a there is a series anyone can rent or you know check out called the Pyramid Code, and it was produced by a, an awesome lady named Dr. Carmen Volter. And what this shows in the Pyramid Code is the fact that the Egyptian culture, the earliest Egyptian cultures, existed in a matriarchal state, where we're now in a patriarchal state. What this means is. There was a time in the earliest Egyptian dynasties where they were in complete harmony with nature. There was a balance between male and female, and it wasn't this male-dominated society that we have today. And so a lot of the uh, petroglyphs, uh, excuse me, not petroglyphs, a lot of the hieroglyphics and various themes depicting ancient Egypt in the early dynasties are not viewed correctly through our current patriarchal male dominated state if you if you if we could understand the context of ancient egypt where there was more of a balance there are things that we just don't understand and let me give you one little example we think we have five senses the egyptians the early egyptians believed in 360 senses and somehow the pineal gland and various other glands within us are like muscles and over thousands or maybe just hundreds of years, we've, we've not exercised those muscles and they've shrunk down to five mm. senses. But it appears the ancient Egyptians could literally stand in front of you and just size you up and know things about you far beyond what we understand today. Okay. Uh, to Canada and Dave. Hi, Dave. Many rose holes are. Hi. Hi. Um, I was sort of wondering, Jason uh, sort of mentioned, uh, I guess he sort of already answered the question in a way, um, but, you know, like you see these uh, the, the, these uh, representations of, like, uh, space shuttle-looking things and, and airplanes, and, and then you have the, uh, the, the astronauts, you know, with the helmets almost looking. That, um, rockets, light bulbs, lots of stuff, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I, I don't want to start another show. Well, actually, that'd be great, but... Um, do you suppose that the military maybe has has like say back in the in the sixties or something has some sort of uh, time travel technology where um, the space men that we know today could possibly be what they saw back then? Hmm. Like that they, they might have traveled to the past. What and... a fascinating question! That's a good one. What a truly fascinating question. Thank you. Um, yes, they did draw these things, these things that we have today. So could that be a function of time travel, something they observed from perhaps our relatively um, recent future? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, In it, other it's words, possible. by the time we create time travel, some of these things would be seen back then because we caused it to occur, Jason? Well, a lot of the theories, too, around some of the descriptions of, you know, the greys, as an example, is, is it's some people hypothesize that on our evolutionary track of going into space, we'd use less of our limbs and more of our mm -hmm. cerebral, and mm -hmm. so we might actually evolve into a state of looking like a grey. And so that's why they're coming back and messing with us, is because that's us in the future just thousands and thousands of years evolved into a space race. Eh, not sure about that, but I do think it's an interesting idea to look at it from the idea that, yes, time travel, I do believe, is something that we have access to now. So why wouldn't we have also gone back into the past and flown around and done stuff? And, yeah, I mean, if, that, if that's the case, it makes sense that ancient man very accurately was depicting us using conveyances of flight with mm -hmm. some type of time travel device slapped on the wing or something, you know? Could be uh, Brandon in Canada. Hello? Brandon, hello. hello. Okay, I, I never heard you say my name. Uh, I, I was did. I was uh, listening about your talk in the Bible, and are you aware that uh, the Bible talks about in uh, Revelations, the asteroids, or 
Yeah, the asteroids that are going to be the weight of a man coming down, the powers of the heavens being shaken numerous times in the New Testament, uh, frightful sights in the heavens, another flood coming. Well, that would be the return of X. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The Bible is full of, throughout it, that, I'm, that I've read, uh, references to everything that you're talking about tonight. Right. Well, you know, the book of Revelations, Wormwood, Armageddon, there are various biblical terms that, yes, seem to tie into other cultures and even earlier versions of the tale. But as we get more clarity into the topic of Armageddon, I still, for me personally, don't fear or think that it's coming on its way simply because of all the evidence that we're finding scientifically, like this larger cycle of time that lasts 24,000 years, and the ancients, like the Mayans and various other cultures, tracked it, we're only here for a speck of time. And I don't want to be too hubristic to think that within 100 years, it's all going to go down. Okay. Illinois, Lauren, hello. Hey, how's it going, Art? Um, Fine. I was, I was wondering if uh, Jason thought... Ison and Planet X had some sort of connection. Ison and Planet X? Yes, I think it's interesting really? that a lot of comets have a very similar elongated orbit, similar to what Planet X's orbit is, where it extends beyond our solar system and possibly passes through the Oort cloud, which is essentially another asteroid belt just billions of miles out there. So, you know, I, whether it's Planet X or a comet, you know, there could be, and there's science behind this, the term nemesis, someone can Google it, but there's research to show that the asteroid belt that's out there, the Oort cloud, could be maybe Planet X or comets, somehow dislodge debris from there and periodically bring them towards us. And that's does, possibly does the what fact could have killed the dinosaurs. Yeah. I'm sorry? Does the fact that Ison is now uh, becoming visible and becoming close and we'll make a close pass to our sun, does that mean that X may be close? I think if we see an influx of more solar activity of objects and debris coming into the inner solar system, yes, I think that that should raise a concern. Because, oh you know, if there is a large planet, it's going to have a lot of debris and comets that get stuck into its gravitational pull in front of it and behind it. Uh, and so... <laughs> My, my gut tells me that if we were to start to see more things being reported, then that might raise an eye for concern. Or or it could be that our near-Earth asteroid program is actually kicked into high gear and they're actually doing something now. Or maybe, <laughs> uh, but we, we get an awful lot of reports, uh, Jason, of uh, that go about like this. Yesterday, astronomers <laughs> tell us Earth had a very close encounter. Right. I know. And I, yeah, I hate that. I mean, yeah, yesterday, I yeah, <laughs> not good. Not um, good. So you, you think a lot of things like Ison. There was another comet, by the way, that blew up recently. In I the guess atmosphere? A few days ago. And uh, so we are getting quite a bit of this sort of thing. And you actually think it could indicate Planet X is somewhere well, nearby. Well, you know, again, I, I, I don't think... Planet X is nearby from the simple point that our amateur astronomy community would be very astute at seeing something four to eight times the size of Earth, One let alone think. a comet. Um, but I just think that if there was an influx of debris all of a sudden being noted hitting the sun and, and, and us, then that, we should look that might raise an eye for concern. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we should look harder. <laughs> um, all right, harder, to right? Uh, boy a lot in Canada. Uh, Canada and Greg, hi. Yes, uh, Roswell's to you both. Thank Art, you. Jason. Um, Thank you. I've got a quick question. Um, I'm curious about the pyramids, and could we not combine the technologies and find out if there's any... E I, was at the, I was listening to their show the other day. Uh, EMPs, is it possible? The electromagnetic the pole? Yeah, the, love the white noise, the recordings of the white noise in the Egyptian pyramids. Oh, huh. Uh... So you're saying, could we start to, like, detect resonance? We, yeah, yeah, has anybody tested that at all? You know, not that I'm aware of. I'm pretty sure that someone has. But uh, that would probably be more in the realm of, you know, like, ghosts and paranormal uh, indications like that. So, 
while I okay. find it fascinating, it's not something that I've pursued or would be able to tell you a line of research. It, it would give uh, information on how their language is and the accent and uh, how it's spoken correctly, right? No? Um, you know, I, I mean, again, we're talking about trying to detect dead people talking in these ancient sites. Yeah. Then, yes, I guess it's possible. Um, and that would be a very interesting uh, piece to throw into the mix. Uh you know what would be really interesting, Jason? Yeah. It would be interesting for some of these people who do EVPs to go to some of the kind of sites that we're talking about right now. Exactly. I think that's exactly what the caller is saying, and that is, you know, it's a cool idea. But but I'd have to throw out there that for me personally, it falls into the line of evidence like channeling aliens or mm -hmm. psychic abilities. Unless I have, with our current sciences, a way to test it, I can't do anything with it other than find it fascinating. Okay. All right. Hold tight for a moment. We'll be right back. You're listening to Dark Matter. And this night, it's with Jason Martell from the high desert, the great American Southwest. I'm Art Bell. Jason Martell is my guest, and we are now going to, well, let's go to Georgia. Down to Georgia and Arnold. Hi, Arnold. Hey, Giga, Giga Roswell Park. Thank you. Okay. I want to ask Jason, um, the two civilizations that I never hear ever visited by aliens for Greece and Rome. It seems always the non-European, uh, non-Caucasian civilizations that got visited by the aliens and needed their help. And not the Greeks and Romans, even though their architecture is massively more advanced than anything the Egyptians or the Aztecs had, and they had things like the, more, the arch, which are massively more advanced than the pyramids. Great question. And, you know, actually, there, there is a lot of influence in the Greco-Roman era, uh, but what we see it through is mainly through art. Uh, even in the Renaissance age, we see various depictions of UFOs and flying shields and things that are put into the artwork. And really, when we talk about Greek and Roman mythologies, it's always around 12 gods which is exactly what the Sumerians talked about, their 12 gods, uh, or excuse me, the, the gods coming from this 12th planet, and a whole systematical breakdown of time and measurement of 12, 12 hours in a day, 12 inches in a foot, 12 in a dozen, the 12 zodiacal houses of the zodiac, breakdown of the heavens. All of that comes from Sumer, and I think is spidered out to other cultures, like the Greeks and Romans picking it up as well. All right. Um, Illinois and Dwayne. Hi, Dwayne. Hello? 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 Diane. Diane, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, I had a question. If we're truly binary, as, as, as um, Jason believes, is that what's causing the effect? Uh, I mean, and what effect does that have on the Earth? And is it possible that's the expl explanation for um, some of the cat catastrophic things we're having in um you, you know, the, the, the warming of the planet and that kind of thing. It's a good question, Diane, and, and I think all of them are connected to some degree, but how I'd answer it is this, is, you know, there, this, this idea that there's this larger cycle of time based on a binary orbit is very interesting because anyone can even study things like in the Vedic ancient texts, they called it the yugas. Uh, a good friend of mine, Walter Cruttenden, who runs this thing called the Binary Research Institute. It's another thing you can Google, the Binary Research Institute. But there's a good amount of data that shows there could be a very interesting connection between our binary orbit and that when the suns are at their closest, we seem to be here on Earth. Uh, maybe it's because of the energies of the sun or it's something we don't understand. We're, we're very highly evolved. When the suns are at their farthest point, we seem to be in the dark ages. Um, there is a lot of good research to suggest that this is the cause of why we have a rise and fall of civilizations here on Earth is because of this connection with our binary orbit. Okay, I just, like I said, I was just wondering if this is, you know, the, the, the you know, how they're saying global warming and all this. Could that be explained? Because how the moon affects tides, could the sun also affect 
the earth in other ways. You understand what I'm asking? I think I understand what you're saying. And, and there's a lot of, you know, people out there that look at like spots on various planets and see like a, a, an upwelling of energy and, and think that there's a connection or various planets are heating up. I don't know what that could be other than maybe it's because our suns possibly are becoming, uh, they're on their way being closer together and there's this buildup of energy that's already starting to take place, and it's going to continue to expedite itself over the next few thousand years. All right. Uh, Gene in Pennsylvania, you're you're on the air. Hey, I was just um, wondering what was your take on star seeds and, you know, their whole ploy to be sent here to help the humanity transition into the new age. Okay, well... You know, I definitely am a believer that there is a hybridization project to some degree, maybe with more than one alien species. Uh, I say that with a somewhat degree of confidence in that if you took this to a court of law, the amount of evidence to stack up and that people who have been abducted, creditable people too, uh, claim to around the world have encounters aboard a spaceship where the, the woman clearly knows that the being has brought her a child that came from her, but it's not completely human. Uh, over and over, there seems to be some type of intervention with us and alien species to interbreed us. Who knows for why? I couldn't even tell you. Okay. Ron in Colorado, you're on the air with Jason Martell. Uh, hi, Art. It's great to hear your voice again after all these years. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, my question is, <clears throat> whatever happened to uh, hale I, I know it came through. I watched it in the summer of 97, just as clear as a bell with the two wings. And it did bear a striking resemblance to the glyph of uh, Nibiru that was in uh, Sitchin's books, and I read them all. And I just wondered, whatever happened to that planet? Where did it go? I mean, that it, we should have seen it comet. on its return. Yeah, the comet. We should have seen it return on its return. As I it, think it, it, it's got a longer return time than that, I believe. Right. Jason, you... Yeah, I, I think, sir. Uh, I, I, and I, again, I'm not accurate, but I, I would say that Nibiru, excuse me, uh, Hale Bob's comet was similar to Nibiru in that it was very elongated and is probably not going to come around into the inner part of our solar system for a very long time. Uh, let's, let's say it's on a 3,600-year comparable orbit to Nibiru. Uh, you know, it might not be around for a long time, but I can't be extremely accurate to tell you exactly when that would be, but I, I know it has an elongated orbit, so it's probably going quite a distance out before it'll return. All right. All right. Jesse in uh, Utah. Hi there. Hey, how's it going, Art? Just fine. Um, I was just curious, um, you know, the Bible, a lot of stories in the Bible, uh, they seem like fantasy, but when okay, you add turn your, fact, do, sir, hold it, turn your radio off, please. Sorry about that. When you uh, add in the fact of uh, extraterrestrial beings, you know, the stories make a lot more sense. I was just curious if uh, maybe chances they just left out, you know, aliens basically out of the Bible. Well, sir, I think it's just a different slant on the term alien or angel all throughout the Bible. Ezekiel seeing wheels within wheels, Elijah being taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, you know, Moses on the mountain giving, you know, having this interaction with a burning bush and this, you know, this energy source up there. I think what it is is just a different interpretation of what we would today call alien. Back then they simply used the term God. But I think this is all a factual case of what took place in the past. But they didn't understand a spaceship or a space shuttle, so they gave references to things around them, like a burning bush or a chariot in the sky. Okay, very quickly, Ron in Canada. Hi, um, it's a privilege to talk to you, Art. And um, thank you. Just, years ago, my wife and I went to, and to Chichen Itza, and before they closed the pyramid and, and I climbed to the top of Chichen Itza and spent about I don't know 45 minutes up there just observing the landscape and and getting the feel of what what it was like up there and you couldn't help but wow. feel and wonder what really went on there like they had an observatory there and um, on the top of the pyramid there's the, 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 the little tomb or the small room that was up there that was really insignificant to anybody who really didn't know much about Chichen Itza and the pyramid there and stuff. 
So I'm just All right, well, well, I have to hold it there, I'm afraid. Um, Jason, we are absolutely out of time. I mean, totally understand. It's gone. I want to thank you for being here. Um, do you have any place you want to refer anybody to? I, I noticed you haven't written a book yet, so uh, you haven't been... So- I do have a book. It's called Knowledge Apocalypse. It's available oh. on Amazon, Knowledge Apocalypse. My final note would just be that I, it was an honor to be on your show, and I hope to be back when I uh, fill you in on expeditions we're doing in 2014. 2014, geez, 2014 team. My God, I can't say that number. <laughs> it's a long show. <laughs> and we're going to be using commercial-grade drones to be getting some interesting B-roll. Wow. Okay, I'll look forward to it, and I certainly appreciate your appearance on the program tonight. Take Take care. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's Jason Martell. And that's it, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. We'll be back and do it again tomorrow. Don't forget the ghost photographs. We're judging them. And, of course, ghost stories. Uh, Email me. I'm Art Bell at artbell.com. Good night.